Hello and welcome to Falcon's Ledge. I'm Ostringer and today you are watching our first full hardware review. Since this is our first hardware review, consider the hardware review process to be a work in progress. I'll be working hard to improve the quality of the reviews that I provide, including a proper set for video, as well as better rigs for joystick cameras that I've featured in this review. So please be patient as I learn and improve. Our first review will be for the X52 from Logitech, or in this stick's case, Satek. The HOTAS in front of us was my primary HOTAS from 2005 to 2018. After that, I upgraded to the Thrustmaster Warthog, which, spoiler, will be our second HOTAS review. This particular model was built by Satek in 2004 according to the stamps on the circuit board. The MSRP for the X52 is $149.99, though it's pretty hard to find them for MSRP at the time of filming. One thing to note about this HOTAS is that the grip texture on the stick is not present on the throttle. That is because this grippy texture interacts with the oils and sweat on your hands and breaks down over time. One week in Elite Dangerous, I decided to ferry passengers from the bubble to Colonia, and over the period of three days, all of the grippy stuff was peeled off. I guess it looks better smooth than all flaky and gross. There are a lot of features with the stick, and for its time, it was a pretty good deal. On the stick side, you have your X and Y axis, and you also have a twist Z axis. The Z axis can be disabled by pulling out this little tab on the bottom of the stick. As you can see, there is still an awful lot of movement in the stick, but this lockout should stop you from yawing, mostly. It has an adjustable palm rest that uses a thumb screw in the handguard to secure it. That is one of the primary reasons for the handguard, other than to, you know, try to make it look super sci-fi. When I purchased it in 2005, I don't remember what I felt about it, but today, I think it's kind of lame. That's just my opinion. On the front of the stick, we have a pinky trigger that can also be used as a clutch. When using it as a clutch, it can be used to multiply the number of effective buttons that the stick has. There are six momentary switches on the base, they are spring-loaded, and they have a decent feel to them, though more of a tactile click would be nice. Each of these buttons has a light in them, and I like having these buttons on the stick because it gives me some additional functionality that I can use on my right hand. On the face of the stick, it has a thumb button that is a bit awkwardly placed. I feel like it should be moved back somewhat, or even down on the thumb rest. The button itself doesn't have a really good feel to it when you click on it. It has two buttons on the right side that are a bit of an awkward reach to get to if you have a full grip on the stick. In order to adequately reach them, you need to change your hand position. This is a common design flaw in Satek Logitech sticks. It has a protected button here that, again, I probably liked in 2005, but it's kind of dumb now. On the other hand, though, the covered button does have a better feel to it than some of the other buttons on the stick. It has two four-way hat switches that have a light in them, but no center click. It has a mode switch on the side here that, when configured properly in the software, can provide you with different button sets or button configurations on the stick depending on what mode you have it in. The mode switch has one of the nicest sounding clicks on the entire stick. The X52 has a dual stage trigger so there's the first stage activation and that is a pretty decent trigger feel. I know when I've activated it. And then there's the second one all the way back there. The second one is a little bit squishy and vague but they both have a decent tactile feedback. The gimbal is a weak spot of all of the Logitech Satek sticks. If this is the first stick you've owned, then you might not realize it, but the gimbal is incredibly sloppy, and there's virtually no dampening. At the time that this was released, most sticks had kind of this feel to them, and you really didn't get into better feeling sticks until you spent a lot more money. Today things have changed with the T16000M, the VKB Gladiator NXT in the same general price range, not to mention the other high-end options. 
Coming back to this stick after using a uh, Warthog and in the NXT, it feels like kind of flying with a wet noodle. The throttle is decent as throttles go. It uses a potentiometer and seems to work pretty well. It does have a tension adjustment on the left side. It has three buttons that originally interfaced with the screen that you see here, but I just use them for buttons in the game and prefer it that way. This is a mouse button and is the left click function on your mouse. And this in front of it is the mouse nub. This thing can kind of sort of control your mouse, but it's really bad. Like if you've ever had one of those laptops with the little mouse nub in the middle. Yeah, it's not that. It's not anywhere close to that. This is kind of like an analog joystick, but it's super inaccurate and really annoying to try to use. To my knowledge, I don't think that it can be mapped to be an analog stick, but I'm not really sure I'd want to use it for one, even if it could. It has two axis wheels on the throttle that can be used as trim, or in a space game you could use them as speed limiters or mining laser throttles. There's a slider axis for your thumb that could also be any of these jobs. The slider tends to develop a little bit of drag over time, and may need some disassembly, sanding, and lubrication to make it smooth again. There's a thumb button and two other buttons, one of which can be used as a clutch, similarly to the clutch used on the stick. There's a four-way hat without push on the front of the throttle that I like using for thrusters in space games. This is one of the pieces that kind of stopped working for me, where it would get intermittent over time. Using the throttle axis itself has a good feel to it, and after getting it adjusted to your preference, works fairly well for fine adjustments. The throttle has an afterburner detent that is very light, it gets lighter and lighter as the throttle is used over time. It also has an encoder on the front of the throttle with a center click. So let's examine how this setup performs in Star Citizen. So we just left New Babbage in our Aegis Vanguard Sentinel. Before starting, I configured the controls like I would have in Elite Dangerous. Out of all of the axes, the yaw axis has the best feel out of all of them. We'll jump out to Port Tressler here. As you can see here, if I let go of the stick, the axis starts crawling immediately. There is a workaround for this. If you unplug the stick and then plug it back in, it resets the axis and the problem goes away. But as you fly, the longer you fly, the further out the axis will get. I do like the absolute speed limiter being at my thumb. It's kind of nice. If the slider didn't catch and drag, it would be even better. One thing I'm starting to realize after flying with this stick again, the X-52 would give me cramps in my right hand after flying for a while. It would get the cramps right here where your palm rests on the thumb rests. The ergonomics are more awkward than you might think. The POV hat is about where you'd expect it to be. This hat is a little bit of a reach. When you're gripping the stick properly and you go to operate this button, but as I manipulate the stick, and this is a comfortable position on the stick, I can stretch to get to the button, but if I want to operate it comfortably, I have to release my palm from the stick to operate the button. These buttons over here are the same. You have to release your grip in order to operate them. Let's get down here and do some flying. The X and Y axis are very loose and very twitchy in the center. 
there's a ton of slopper in the center of the stick. As I mentioned before, the Z-axis is actually the best axis in terms of translation of movement into the movement of your ship. The gimbal itself has a lot of drag and does not smoothly operate. This is actually a problem with this gimbal type and it's inevitable for it to wear rough spots in the ring or plate and become sticky. I've sanded and lubricated this stick and it all just comes back and gets rough again. Look at all this movement here. This is my pitch axis. I have no dead zone set and still no movement. Here's my roll axis, same thing. Lots of movement with no translation of movement in the game. We've been flying for a while and now hands off you can see that one of our axes is drifting. This is due to the use of low quality hull sensors. Most users mitigate this behavior by resetting the axis or setting a larger dead zone. In regular maneuvers where you're using larger movements, the stick feels fine in terms of how the movement of the stick translates to movement in the game. But when it comes down to fine movement, that's where it becomes really bad. So, to test fine movement, we'll be looking at DCS aerial refueling. The only way for me to really demonstrate the differences here is to show you a comparison. This is not something we're going to make a habit on in all of our stick reviews. So in the first flight, we're going to refuel using the X-52. And in the second clip, we'll be using the Warthog. This is not to compare these two sticks as peers, but rather to illustrate why having a good sensor is of crucial importance for very detailed flying. So we set a dead zone of four and a 30% curve on all axis, as without it, the oscillation is really bad with the X-52. And by adding curves, it flattens out the sloppiness of the gimbal and especially the sloppiness of the sensor. We're doing this to try to give the X-52 as much of a fair chance against the Warthog as possible. On the Warthog, we'll be running no curves, no dead zone. I practiced aerial refueling with the X-52 on many occasions, and it was a source of much frustration for me. Again, I do like the throttle, and it works just fine for these kinds of movements. So here as we approach, you can already see the excess of movements my right hand is having to make to approach the refueling aircraft. Trying to keep things as smooth as I can here, but as you can see I'm already dealing with some oscillation. It's not that there's no pilot induced oscillation with the Warthog, there still is. But the nature of the sensors make the oscillation worse. I've now backed off because it's a common mistake to stay close to the basket and try to control the oscillation instead of just backing off and getting a new run at it.
Hey, look, we connected. Man, it feels like it's jumping around constantly on me. I can't seem to settle in. This makes it really challenging. Pay close attention to the right hand movements and how big they are and how frequently correction is required. Some more oscillation there. Once again, we get connected, but I still just can't get settled in. So let's compare this to the same run with the Warthog. The first thing to notice is just how much smaller the movements I can use to perform the same adjustments, and how the adjustments made translate into movement that is predictable in the aircraft. Now, some of the reduction in movement does have to do with the fact that I'm not using curves, but if we weren't using curves in the X-52, the oscillation problem becomes much worse. Here we get connected on our first approach, but I immediately have lag and it pops right back out. So let's get reconnected. I left this one in here just so that it wouldn't look like I was giving any favoritism. Here we go, back connected, and immediately I settle in, now concentrating on what I call flying the spot. I pick a spot on the fueling aircraft and I hold it in one location. Now I'm not an expert at aerial refueling, but I can get it done if I need to. We're not going to fill the whole tank up here, but I think this demonstrates my point. Let's take a look at the gimbal. Pardon the video, this is my first time I've been using this rig. This is the gimbal for the X-52. The tube of the stick comes down through the center of the gimbal like most gimbals, so the sensor for one of the axes is stationary, and when moving the axis, it causes the magnet to move in a linear fashion. That's because the X-52 uses linear hall sensors, not 3D hall sensors. One thing that I'm not a fan of is that these wires here rub up against a very sharp edge at the bottom of the joystick tube. If you look closely, you can see that the wires are worn. The top part of this gimbal operates using a spring, an angled plate 
and a cup. The plate pushes up against the cup as your axis moves and it compresses the spring. This area between the plate and the cup is a natural wear location. I've used some lubrication, but it still wears down rather badly. The stick shell is hard plastic, covered by rubber, which we discussed before. The molding seems pretty average. This is the twist element. This uses a potentiometer or pot. These are dual stage triggers. There are actually two buttons side by side, first and second stage. The twist stick is held in by these two screws, all plastic construction. Throttle construction is fairly straightforward. The throttle is also a potentiometer, and you can see how that works. Check it out, we've got some cobwebs in here. Hopefully we don't find the owner. One thing I might not like here is that when you move the throttle, it can stress these wires. They're not rubbing like the wires in the joystick. They're just being bent back and forth. This kind of bending motion can cause wires to fatigue and break over time. There's some lubrication here, but the lube is getting old and breaking down. I'll fully admit that I have not disassembled this joystick and re-lubed it in the past. One thing you'll notice is that the bottom plate of the throttle actually provides the clamping force for the axis. It would be nice if they had it built so that the bottom plate could be removed and having the throttle be still functional in that case, but that isn't something we're going to hold against them. One thing I've heard people talk about is that using hot glue to secure wires is a sign of low quality, and it can be. But in this case, when you see hot glue used to secure wires that are 16 years old now and the glue is still holding great, Yes, if you use hot glue to secure wires that has any kind of stress on them or any kind of movement, that is a bad thing, because it won't likely hold. But in this case, it seems just fine. I'm not going to hold that against Logitech, or Satech in this case. So, let's talk pros and cons. We'll start with the pros. The first one is price. At an MSRP of 149 if this is your hard limit to purchase a HOTAS, we'd still probably go with a T16000M over an X52. But if you're not a fan of the Thrustmaster or the T16000M, then this would probably be the next setup we'd recommend. Second pro would be the number of buttons and functions. For the money, you'll find it pretty hard to find a stick with more options. And when you take into account the mode switch and the clutch, you should have no problem finding buttons for your Sims functionality. Number three is a decent throttle. The throttle is a high point for the X52. The throttle feels good, it's ergonomic, the axis feels pretty good, and it has a good number of functions on it. Number four is an easy to use software. The Logitech software is really intuitive, it's easy to use, has a good UI, and I think that even someone who is kind of new to the joystick world would be able to use it pretty well. Now let's move on to the cons. Number one is going to be quality. While being considered at least average upon release, it severely lags behind modern sticks with a few exceptions. Number two is age. This might sound like an odd con, but when the X52 was released in the early 2000s, it was a good stick for the cost. But in 2020, the technology feature in the X52 is not up to par with its direct competition the T16000M. And when compared to better sticks in the segment, like the Gladiator and XT, that difference really shows. Number three is accuracy. Not only is the gimbal itself very inaccurate and a sloppy mess, the sensors are of extremely low quality and are especially sloppy in the center, which is a major issue for fine adjustments. Number four is ergonomics. The throttle isn't really a problem, but the stick actually caused cramps in my hand near my thumb because of poor ergonomics after a while of use. One of the hats and several of the buttons require changing of hand positions to comfortably use them. Number five is aesthetics. This stick may have looked futuristic in the early 2000s, but it now just looks outdated. Now we'll move on to some recommendations. Should you buy this stick? My first inclination would be no. But we'll change that to conditionally maybe? Yeah, that's pretty vague, but I'll explain. At the $149 price point, you have the T16000M and TWCS setup, 
which is a good deal better than the X52. Overall, I recommend buying deeper into the mid-range. Doing so will give you considerably better experience, but at the same time, I understand having a price limit on such things. Personally, if I've got a budget, I don't mind breaking these kinds of purchases into pieces, so in that case, I would totally buy the $125 Gladiator NXT, and then wait a little while and pick up a $200 Tex Arc Standard Throttle when it's released, to end up with a considerably better setup. But that's just me. If you already have an X52, but you're seeing some of the issues I've mentioned with the stick, the throttle is already decent, so keep it. And in that case, what I would do is pick up, again, the VKB Gladiator NXT and ditch the X52 stick, and you'll be having a great time. If the GNX is too much, pick up the T16000M, but trust me on this one, the difference in price is well worth it between those two sticks. I do also have some recommendations for Logitech. The joystick market used to be a fairly slow-moving industry, and to some degree, that's still true. Most companies don't come out with a new version of every product every single year, like some hardware. But the X52, which is still being sold as new, nearing almost 20 years since it was released, it's time for a new joystick at this price point. So if Logitech decides to build a new $150 to $200 Hotess, here is what they should do differently. Number one, don't try to reinvent the wheel at this price point. Going extreme on aesthetics tends to alienate as many people as it attracts, or more. If you want to see good examples of non-replica sticks, look no further than the Gladiator NXT or the Constellation Alpha. Number two, ditch the gimbal design you've been using. Ditch it completely. It's not good. It's one of the worst on the market. Look at literally all of your competition for examples on where to go with a new gimbal design. Number three, 16-bit 3D hall sensors or 16-bit magneto-resistive sensors. Please, take whatever sensor you used in the X52 and the X56, throw it away, and never look in its general direction again. Through this review, you might get the feeling that I'm just hating on this stick or hating on Logitech, and I can totally understand why you might think that. Keep in mind that this is a very old stick and that this review is comparing it with the context of what other sticks are available today. I truly hope that Logitech will release a new stick into the market at this price point and I would be happy to review it and hopefully be completely delighted at the improvements over the old design. Remember that I'm giving away two Star Citizen starter ships with game packages when my channel hits 500 and 1000 subscribers. All you have to do to enter is be subscribed and comment on my videos from the beginning of 2021 to the end of when the drawing takes place. A random video will be selected, and from that random video, a random comment from that video will win the ship. I hope you enjoyed this video. It was a challenge to create, and I hope to be able to make more of these very soon. The next review will be on the venerable Thrustmaster Warthog Hotas. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe to help the channel grow. The bigger the channel gets, the more access I'll have to new hardware to be able to test for you all. Please leave a comment in the comment section down below, and I hope you have a great day.